In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This Sunday is one of the more entertainingly named Sundays of the Church here, Quasimodo Genity. That is to say, it's not the Sunday of the Hunchback of Notre Dame, although that is the source of the name of the creature. No, in fact, it's actually named for the Latin expression, newborn babes, as newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk. And this Sunday, we actually have a reading that has one of the rare exceptions in the entirety of our scriptures from end to end. One of those places where there is a variation between two significantly different versions of the text. This variata comes to us from 1 John chapter 5. Usually the variata in the New Testament are minuscule or even smaller than that. Sometimes an accent on a word may or may not be present. Sometimes the particular form of a word may vary slightly in spelling or ever so slightly in sequence or structure. This is less than 10% of anything contained in the scriptures. But, unlike the Mormon church, unlike the Muslim faith, we don't hide variata from our eyes. We leave them in plain sight and make note of them and even take a look at what they may do in terms of altering our understanding of the text. If you have a, an ESV Bible, you'll find a footnote in there that tells you to go look at this thing. Some manuscripts say blank. If you have a King James, a King James or New King James Bible, there will be a footnote that says some manuscripts say this, because there's a slight variation. Today we're going to look at the New King James Version, the longer of the two readings. The Lord has preserved his word for us. It never changes who our Savior is or what our Savior does. It simply broadens our understanding of what may be contained therein. The word of John, the word of 1 John chapter 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The world must be overcome and defeated. We live in constant battle between the faith and the world that surround us on every side, always under persecution, because even though it seems as if the world is kind and tolerant to Christianity, that is never the case. The world around us is always oppositional to the Christian faith, always seeking to oppose and destroy, and doing it in very small and subtle ways so that it can chip away a little bit at what we see before us. There has never been a time when the world as a whole has been at peace with the Christian faith. It has only seemed that way. From outside, those seeking to injure the Christian faith have gained full command of our public schools and universities. In the roughly 18,000 hours we invest in our children's lives in K-12 through education in the public school, we expect that somehow or another, with less than 100 hours per year in church and Sunday school, we will be able to offset the 18,000 hours. 1,200 and 18,000 are not comparable numbers by any measure. The persecution from outside, those who are oppositional to the faith, and those who are not themselves oppositional, but teach from a curriculum that is oppositional to the faith, and the curriculum that is overpowering all that is done, these things are set against Christianity with their teeth set on edge. They can have no God who is the true God. And in its place, any God will do just fine. As long as you disobey the first commandments, the world will be content with you having another God. We suffer persecution from within. People claiming the name Christian will say things like, well, my God would never say whatever that thing is that I think is offensive inside Christianity. Well, Dear Christians, the person who says that has a God who is no God. It's an imaginary God. The God that I take off of his throne and replace with my own God, of my own making and my own doing, that God is no God at all. That's just me. 
I put a mirror up there and say, I would never say that, homosexu that homosexuality is wrong or evil. Therefore, God must also, because I am God and he is not. It is by grace, through faith, that our believing comes to us a gift of God. And this faith received in baptism is the only thing that can stand against us in the swell and the tide of all that that is seeking to overpower us in the world. St. John continues in chapter 5. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. St. John is giving us some very dense theology here. Jesus comes to us by water and the blood, that is, sacramentally, forgiving sins by way of baptism, by way of the Lord's Supper. The triune God in heaven bears witness, and this is one of just a few places where we find an explicit description and language of what the Trinity is. We find it in the first chapter of the first chapter of Genesis, the first chapter of John, a couple of other occurrences, and right here in 1 John chapter 5. The witness on earth concurs with Jesus' promise. I will send you my spirit, and my spirit will lead you into all truth. He will testify of me. The spirit comes with the water and the blood, agreeing as one. And so we should always test the spirits. When something claims to be from God, claims to be a word from the Lord, it should always agree with the word of the Lord. And it should always speak in the same way. Faith comes by hearing, hearing, and the water of the water of baptism, and it is reinforced and built and held up by the sacrament of Holy Communion. When there is a word that comes from the Spirit of God that tells you to ignore the sacraments or avoid the hearing of the Word of God, that is not the Word of God speaking. That which is of God can only testify to Jesus and nothing else. Other spirits speak differently. Other spirits point to other means, like a feeling inside me, an intellectual understanding, a practice that is outside of the Christian faith which does not uplift or reinforce the things that we have been taught since our youth, that's outside. Now the variation here comes up this way. The longer section you just heard, the shorter version, which is what's contained in the ESV, sounds like this. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. The variant text kind of loses a little bit of the explicitness of the Trinitarian theology, but it's still there. And it still fits, and it still preaches the same incontrovertible Jesus, the Jesus that is a sacramental Jesus, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. The physical means by which salvation comes to us does not disagree with the revelation the Spirit delivers. In fact, they are the same message. John continues, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe in God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given of his Son. Dear Christians, we still have the ability to turn away from God, and that is not what he wants for us. It is the faith in us that fights against the world, and it is the faith in us that fights against our old sinful self, which seeks to pull us away from the Lord. Instead, he draws you here. He draws you here to hear and to receive, to constantly be blessed and uplifted, to be preserved in the faith so that he will preserve you to salvation at the end of days. This is the promise of God, that he not only gives you the water, the spirit, and the blood that agree as one, but he gives you these things to build you up in the Christian faith 
every day. In the name of Jesus, 